oh, now I gotta ask the host to give permission to record. How about you record, uh, Robin? You are already recording, great. So welcome everybody. My name is Tommy Soares. I am the Assistant Director of the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology and Infectious Disease. Welcome to another Purdue Lecture Hall series where it is my pleasure and honor to introduce you to Lauren Wilbanks, who is a PhD candidate working in Elizabeth Parkinson's lab in the Department of Chemistry. Uh, welcome, Lauren, and thank you so much for taking time to tell us a little bit about your adventures in research and how you got into this. I am so excited to hear your talk, you know, because I typically think of natural products all coming from plants. And I'm originally a plant biologist and I always thought, oh, natural products. Well, we extract those from plants and we feed them to people to prevent diseases like cancer or so on and so forth. But that's not the case with the work you're doing. You're actually extracting natural products from a bacteria. And that is, mind boggling. So I am so thrilled to have you on our program today and to hear a little bit about your work and to get to meet you. So thanks again for taking time and please take it away. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to share my research. Um, so just uh, thumbs up everyone can see that. Good to go. All right. Yeah, so um, and to, to that kind of background, everyone thinks, a lot of people think about natural products coming from plants um, and microbes are kind of, you know, the enemy. However, uh, in the Parkinson lab, microbes are actually our very best friends. Um, and our kind of little motto here is from microbes to medicines. Let me turn on my pointer to make this easier. Um, so, yeah, so natural products as medicine. So what are just a background about natural products? So they're kind of uh, metabolites that we isolate from uh, natural environments. So that could be um, from plants, as we noted, uh, it can be from fungi, um, or it can be from uh, bacteria. Um, so 64% uh, of approved anti-cancer drugs are inspired by natural products. Um, and 59% of approved antibacterial drugs are also inspired by natural products. Um, and what we're interested in the Parkinson lab is um, the uh, antibiotics and natural products that come from these streptomyces bacteria. So streptomyces are um, bacteria that grow in the soil. They kind of um, look a little bit like molds, but are definitely bacteria. Uh, and they produce a plethora, a, a large majority of the natural products that we know and love actually come from these um, streptomyces organisms. So why do microbes produce natural products, right? Like we're using them for anti-cancer and antimicrobials, but like why on earth would a bacteria make something useful for us? Well, what they're actually doing is making murder weapons uh, to fight off other uh, bacteria or fungi or um, anything in the soil that they encounter. So essentially what happens is um, they'll get signals from the soil and then they'll produce natural products um, in response to these signals from the soil. And so um, of course there was a kind of a golden age in um, natural product or antimicrobial discovery. Uh, unfortunately, kind of everyone knows about the rise of antimicrobial resistance. So there's uh, an extensive need for novel antimicrobials, natural products. Um, so what we're kind of interested in is these cryptic natural products. So um, there are a lot of known natural products that come from streptomyces, but there's even more predicted that are just kind of lurking within these streptomyces genomes. We just don't understand in the lab how to activate them. There's some sort of complex signaling that happens in the soil that tells these streptomyces to activate those, those cryptic natural products. So what my research does is essentially try to derive ways to, um, to, to get at these natural products. So my first objective is to kind of devise an assay that'll let us know when these natural products are activated. And what we're, what we're using is kind of the regulatory system that already exists within streptomyces uh, and kind of making that 
um, a, a tool in our assay using molecular genetics. So I'll talk a little bit about how first natural products are regulated. So in um, molecular genetics and genomics, we have what's called the central dogma. Uh, and so that essentially means that RNA uh, is transcribed, or excuse me, DNA is transcribed to RNA with this RNA polymerase, and then RNA is translated into proteins with a ribosome. So of course, uh, these bacteria uh, aren't constantly expressing every gene in their genome. So how do we, how do these bacteria regulate these natural product genes in particular? So one of the ways we know they do that is using repressors. Uh, and those repressors are kind of very aptly named. They're proteins that bind to specific sites in the DNA called promoters. Uh, and that inhibits this RNA polymerase from binding and transcribing. And therefore no genes can be produced. So you can think of repressor as, as like an off switch to any gene. They bind and stop this, this process of transcription and translation. So we are very interested in the, the repressors that modulate these natural products. Um, so what we're doing is looking at how they might be induced. So of course, if, if repressors are kind of the lock, uh, then there must be some sort of key that activates or relieves the, the repression. So what'll happen here is that um, these uh, repressors are, uh, the, the repression is inhibited by inducers. And what these inducers will do is they'll bind to the repressors and that causes a change in the structure of these proteins, these repressor proteins. So can no longer bind to that promoter region. So you can see in this figure here, so uh, under if the, the repressor is being expressed, it binds to that promoter region, and then the RNA polymerase cannot bind, and there's no transcription and no translation. No, no gene is being produced. Um, if there is the small molecule inducer here, that'll bind to an active site on the repressor, relieve it from that genome, make it unable to bind to that genome. RNA polymerase can come in, transcription, translation, proteins, all that good stuff. So what we know is that this is a very basic uh, a level of understanding of transcription and translation and the, the regulation that, that occurs there. Um, and Streptomyces is a super complex organism. So we kind of just want to know, uh, take, take these repressors a little bit out of that giant cluster of regulation and just study the repressors and inducers that are involved in natural product production. So the way we do that is using molecular genetics tools. So you've probably heard about cloning as like Dolly the sheep or like weird test tube babies or something futuristic. But in molecular genetics, we use cloning all the time to just essentially transplant copies of genes. So what we'll do is if we like a gene from one organism, we can amplify and cut and paste into um, what we typically use as a plasmid. Um, so these are the small circular pieces of DNA um, that are replicated and, and carried in a cell. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll amplify and copy that gene of interest and we'll pop that into our, our plasmid. And that plasmid we can just put in some E. coli or some organism that we can manipulate really easily. Uh, and then we can, uh, we can produce and isolate and study those genes. So one of the ways that people like to uh, study transcription and translation and repression and all that is using this GFP molecule. So uh, GFP stands for green fluorescent protein. Um, so it literally glows green when exposed to UV. Um, and this is, uh, I got some super fun pictures for you guys. So it was originally isolated from a, a, a bioluminescent jellyfish. Um, and then we have somebody popped it into an axolotl down here. I think we have some mammalian cells up here expressing some, um, some GFP. Um, some, there's also RFP, red fluorescent protein, blue fluorescent fluorescent protein. Uh, and then we have somebody did this some nice plate art right here. So what happens here is that we can use this fluorescent protein to indicate if genes are being turned on or turned off. So this is really great. So let's put this kind of all together. So what we'll do is we'll take our plasmid, we'll clone in that repressor, we'll clone in the promoter region upstream of the GFP such that the GFP is regulated by that repressor. So you can kind of like follow this image down here. If our repressor is expressed, it'll bind to that promoter region upstream of the GFP and inhibits the GFP production. Because again, while it's bound there, the RNA polymerase can't bind. It can't express any RNA and therefore there's no protein expression. 
Um, so then what we'll do if we're trying to test these repressor inducer pairs is we'll actually add these inducer molecules and we'll be able to see uh, based on the toggling of GFP turning on or off if these inducers actually bind and inhibit the binding of uh, the repressors. So kind of bringing it all together, just a little bit of data here. Again, if there's no glowing, the repressor is still bound and there's no GFP expression. If there is glowing, then the molecule, the small inducer, uh, has bound uh, and removed the repressor and that's uh, expression of GFP. So we're, this is just a little bit of data. Um, we're trying to uh, test essentially uh, derivatives of molecules that are known to bound to this Streptomyces sila color repressor, SCDR. And what we've done here is first we made a repressorless plasmid, so it'll just constitutively express GFP. That just means the GFP is always on. There's no repressor in the system. So you can see this nice huge bar here means lots of GFP is being expressed. And here's our, our derivative of the small molecule that we know uh, induces um, is the inducer molecule that binds to SCDR. However, what we're noting is that um, the, the structure of the derivative we've made, we've changed the structure so that it no longer binds to the SCDR and no longer uh, removes it from the genome and, and doesn't allow GFP expression. So what we see is when we have our repressorless plasmid, giant expression of GFP, and then this inducer is actually not activating GFP, GFP expression. So that is our, uh, our objective one, and we're still uh, developing this assay. I'm working closely with um, synthetic organic chemists who are synthesizing these, um, these small uh, inducer molecules, and we're kind of testing um, what's called the promiscuity of these repressors, the ability of these repressors to bind different structures and different molecules. So that's objective one. So Objective two is kind of like, yeah, we're gonna be trying to induce expression of, um, of our antibiotics, or excuse me, our natural products still. So for our objective one, we kind of are testing out these known repressors and known inducers. But what about predicted inducers that interact with unknown repressors or unknown regulators of natural products? So um, some of the kind of interesting work that's coming out is that streptomyces will actually respond to external antibiotics made in the soil. So what's happening is they're chilling, they're living their life, they're just trying to grow and eat and reproduce, whatever. And along comes a fungi or another bacteria and they produce antibiotics to try to kill the streptomyces. The streptomyces will interpret that signal and it'll produce a natural product in response to try to kill it back. So the way that we're going about doing that Again, is like there's multiple ways essentially that um, these streptomyces interpret signals, um, but the 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 brass tacks of how they actually turn these natural products on is they either decrease or increase um, different uh, enzymes in response to these external stimulations. Yeah. Um, so what they'll actually do, the way they they do this, is they will change the amount of RNA that is expressed. So that begs the question, how do we quantify change in RNA expression? If this RNA, the change in expression is telling us that there's more or less natural products being turned on and produced, um, we wanna know a method to, to kind of get at that and access that information. So the protocol that we've developed in our lab or implemented in our lab is um, we want to use quantitative polymerase chain reaction or qPCR to understand that change in gene expression. Uh, and so stepwise, what you do is first you need to isolate that RNA, uh, you need to convert it to DNA, and then you run your, your qPCR. So let's see how those steps actually play out. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna grow our streptomyces um, and we're gonna inoculate it with an antibiotic that it might encounter in its habitat. So we've determined that one of these is oxytetracycline. So what we'll do is we'll grow up our cultures and induce them with oxytetracycline. And then we also have control cultures that we don't induce with oxytetracycline because we need to understand really what's going on there. And we absolutely need a control to, to drive that information. Uh, and then after we do our induction, we take samples every day. For step two, we go ahead and isolate uh, and reverse transcribe that, um, that RNA. 
So first we need, after we take our samples, we lyse, we capture that RNA using just spin columns. Uh, and then we elute just pure RNA. We need to get that RNA from all the other ribosomes or DNA or any sort of cellular debris that I'll inhibit. We just need pure RNA. Uh, and then reverse transcriptase um, re transcribes RNA into cDNA. Um, so that cDNA, uh, is first of all, can be amplified. RNA cannot be amplified. Uh, and it's also much more stable than RNA is. Uh, and it's a more flexible molecule um, to use in our, our technique. So our third step here is qPCR. Um, and the way that qPCR works is essentially you have in your reaction um, these fluorescent molecules. Uh, and those fluorescent molecules will bind into double-stranded DNA. So when you run your rounds of PCR, when you're amplifying your DNA, it'll pop itself into that DNA backbone. And as you increase your amount of double-stranded DNA in your PCR reaction, you'll get increasing amount of fluorescence that you can kind of see with this figure down here. So what we'll know by the end of that, how it's quantitative, is that if you start with a higher concentration of DNA, then you're going to, um, create a fluorescent curve, a, a high peak in fluorescence quicker than you would if you had less DNA. So the way that um, some, some data from our, that our lab that we produce, again, we have our um, streptomyces silicolor. We throw that in a flask. We induce with our oxytetracycline. And then we observe the change in this actinorhodin gene. So this actinorhodin gene is actually really cool. It's this uh, makes a blue color. Um, on the left, you can kind of see a, like a, a little bit more intense blue. It's easier to see physically in person. And, and then on the right, which is our control, our uninduced, you don't see as intense blue. This actinorhodin and streptomyces color is actually just constitutively expressed. But we do note, as you can see with this data on the left, that around 72 hours post-induction, we see a, a large uh, fold change, six times as much actinorhodin uh, natural product being produced than in the control blast, the uninduced blast. So overall, what I would like you guys to take away from this is that there are many novel natural products, so anti-cancers, antibiotics, antifungal compounds that are not expressed in our standard laboratory conditions. Um, we can find inducers that might turn on natural product expression by studying the interaction between these inducers and natural product repressor proteins. And then molecules, like antibiotics made by other microbes can also turn on natural products as a defense mechanism for our streptomyces cultures. So I saved my kind of career for last. Um, you probably hear from a lot of people that are just like, I knew from infancy that I wanted to get a PhD and I was born to do this. That's not really my story. It kind of took me a while to get here. So um, I attended the University of Florida um, for my undergraduate career. And I was just a little, I was a little bit of a wayward student. I didn't graduate with like the best GPA and I didn't exactly knew, know what I wanted to do when I graduate, but I did have this job at Mary U Nutrisciences as a research food microbiologist. Um, I got to take home a lot of free food. One of my friend's mom still knows me as the peanut butter girl because I gave away so many jars of peanut butter that we had tested. Um, so as I was there, I was just kind of doing my job and I was a little bit stuck in the mud and I was like, okay, you know, Mary U will pay for a little bit of my education. Why not just go back and get my master's? We'll see, it'll be great for my career prospects. Let's see what's up. So as I was attending um, the, my master's program at UF, I was just absolutely gobsmacked with the amount of cool research that was being done out there. I remember in particular, I was, um, I was sitting in a lecture for a like immune therapy course where the professor just casually mentioned that he like cured his cat's cancer using a lentiviral like vector or something. And I was like, oh, are we just doing that now? Are we just curing cancer? That's bonkers. So I um, kind of steeled myself and I was like, this is really cool, but I don't know if I have what it takes to get a PhD. So I started, I actually just kind of quit my job and started volunteering at an academic research lab. Um, and this, I was doing some like DNA board coding um, to, for uh, the, the PI that I was working with. 
And I really liked doing research. I had a lot of fun with it. So much good conversations to have with people. And I just, it was a great environment. So I took the plunge and I applied for PhD programs. Uh, and I got into the interdisciplinary life sciences program here at Purdue. And it's honestly been an amazing experience. Truly, I, if you told me when I was failing organic chemistry that I would one day be getting a PhD in chemistry, I would have laughed at right at your face. But I really think that what it takes to be a scientist is not 100% what you learn in a classroom. You need to be, think creative creatively. Like it's not enough to know topics. You really need to be able to draw associations between things that you learn and maybe take that plunge and be like, well, well what about this idea? Like that, that it's a little crazy maybe, but kind of a lot of scientists are a little bit crazy. Um, it takes a lot of dedication. You have to be committed to showing up every day and getting the work done. Uh, it takes persistence, absolutely keeping at your problems, keep asking questions, resiliency. There's a lot of failure when it comes to science. And that's kind of just part of the process. Um, and you need to be able to bounce back and be able to get back at the bench and get back to doing what you love because it is truly rewarding. And for me, one of the biggest things was humility. I absolutely know that most rooms that I walk into, I'm the dumbest person there. And that's, at, that's totally an opportunity to ask all the questions in the world. I can't really go lower. So I might as well learn everything I possibly can from the smart people that I'm surrounded with. And you can see the, the Parkinson lab right here um, has been an amazing environment to kind of foster that knowledge. So um, that is what I have for you guys. And I would really love to take questions if you have any about my research or any about college or grad school or what it's like to work in a lab. I would absolutely love to take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lauren. That was so interesting and, and such a such an awesome trajectory to get to do what you're doing now. Um, I'm I am curious about, you know, that volunteer experience that you had in the lab. And how did you go about just going to volunteer and how would you recommend if somebody is curious and they wanted to get started how should they go about it yeah no that's a great question i like even i i kind of took the plunge like funnily enough i just got out of a relationship and i just look, looking at myself and i'm like what am i doing here like come on like you need to like take the energy like take take the the initiative seize the day and I was at um, the microbiology and cell science building at UF. I was there to get a letter of recommendation from another professor. And I had emailed the second professor who I was interested in working with and he just hadn't responded to me. And I walk into the lab and I noticed that his office is right next to the professor that I was there to see. And I start walking out of the building and I'm like, Lauren, just do it. Like, wait, you can't get any lower. Like, just go ahead, take that plunge. And so I walk into his office and I was like, hi, my name is so-and-so. I sent you an email. I'd love to talk about volunteering in your lab. And one of the things that is so funny to me about academia is that you watch all this media and the way that academics are presented is they're kind of scruffy or rude or they don't have a lot of social skills or whatever. Academ like academics are some of the nicest people I've ever met. They are simultaneously incredibly busy, but will also essentially give you the shirt off their back. They will work super hard for you. They are so interested and especially young scientists, growing young scientists. And my number one recommendation for anyone who is interested is go ahead and just take that plunge. If you're interested and you, you think something's really cool and you know you have the time and the dedication and the wherewithal to stick with something, go ahead and reach out to a professor. If you're in a location where you know someone's doing research or you can get there if you have transportation, um, absolutely just go ahead and take that plunge. The worst they can say is no. And if they're mean to you, then you don't wanna work with them anyway. So that is, that's absolutely my advice to anyone who's, who's really interested in, in pursuing um, academic research. I think that is so true. And I think mm -hmm. that is right exactly where we really want everybody to have is to get that courage, have that conversation like you did and say, you know what, just turn back 
just do this. Yeah, they, it's the Nike mm-hmm. logo, right? Just do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's not, and it's not wait to do it. It's not wait until tomorrow or when you have a little bit more time. It's now. Do it now because it's that initiative, that impulse that uh, gets you the courage uh, to go and knock on the door and talk to them. And I really appreciate what you said. Yeah, you know, academics are portrayed in a certain way. Uh, It's a generalization, just like we can't generalize about people. Mm -hmm. Everybody's an individual and you might get along well with people and you might not get along well with Mm -hmm. other people, right? Absolutely. You know, you mentioned also the chemistry that you like you have with the people in your lab. How important is that? How important is it for you to be excited uh, to work with the people that you're working with, as well as be excited about the science that you're mm-hmm. working on? So the, the funny thing is that I do a lot of mentoring to incoming students. Um, so I'm on the uh, graduate student, um, our like board of directors. Um, and I tell everyone when you're coming in, you don't, you, you pick the project, but you pick the principal investigator, the researcher that you're going to be that their, their lab that you're working in, you pick them over the project any day. You will learn to love your project. You will learn to hate your project. But at the end of the day, you're almost entering like a marriage with this person for the next five years of your life. So you yes. definitely want to go in um, with someone who understands um, who gets your background, who um, is accepting. And um, and that's something that um, I definitely found. This is Dr. Elizabeth Parker, it is right here. Um, she is phenomenal. Um, one of my, gra- one of my um, the other grad students in the lab, actually his story is pretty funny. He was looking, uh, it, it was like a poster session where he was picking labs to interview with. And he had his form all filled out and he was going to turn it in and he walked he walks past Dr. Parkinson's booth. And after a five minute conversation with her, he got a new form and put her at the top because she was so nice and yes. pleasant and could describe her research. He, his, his exact phrasing was, you can't fake that nice. And honestly, I think we need to put that on a t-shirt because that is absolutely my PI. She's such a joy to work for. Um, to speak to the individuals in the lab, this are, the Parkinson lab is kind of unique in that it is truly interdisciplinary. Um, so I do a lot of molecular genetics, synthetic biology. We have synthetic organic chemists. We have people who study cancer, like signaling. We have people um, who are doing more strict microbiology. So that um, has challenges and benefits in the fact that it, it can be challenging sometimes if you don't have a, a collection of individuals who are doing similar things than you. Um, so you don't have a broad um, kind of array of opinions to go to that are right there. Um, However, usually um, you can, that just kind of makes you a better researcher. You're going on, you're hitting the literature, you're Googling, you're doing all that stuff. Um, So that kind of fosters independence in that kind of area. Uh, And again, the, the benefit here is that, you know, any day that I go into the lab, I could be talking to someone about, you know, like, MIC inhibition of MIC, uh, like an oncogene, or I could be talking to someone about peptide synthesis and how cyclic peptides are like uh, utilizing them as natural products. Backgrounds that I don't understand, but it has, it's such good practice to be able to communicate effectively to individuals who are in completely diametric opposites of the life sciences, and we have to come together and, and discuss issues and collaborate. Um, so absolutely, the lab environment here is, in, in my lab is phenomenal, and I don't think we would be so successful as an interdisciplinary lab if individuals didn't have that kind of like um, desire for collaboration that is so abundant in our lab. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. And I wonder if we can touch back a little bit on some of the concepts that you spoke about, because you were, you, I mean, I, I wouldn't say you rushed through it, but you were fairly quick about, you know, a repressor and inducer. Mm-hmm. And maybe let's, let's just talk a little bit more about the role of the promoter in a gene 
that acts as a switch to turn on expression and turn off expression. And that many times we have these uh, components that sit on top of the promoters and stop the polymerase from being able to transcribe that gene. And so it's so neat the way that, that, that this happens in, in, mm -hmm. a, in a lot of our genes. So I'm wondering if you can give us a little bit more on you know, this, this idea of you are looking for these small molecules that mm -hmm. we're calling them inducers, but they, it's because they repress they re, the repressor. Isn't yeah, that and right? that, yeah. That's what makes so, it a little difficult to talk about, right? Where it's you have repressors, which on there are like, uh, that's an off state, right? Yes, and they stop. you have to kind of, yeah, you have to kind of tell people to like, think about it in reverse because these small, the addition of these small molecules, these inducers will stop the repression. So it's like a double negative. Yes. Uh, and so it is difficult to, to, to describe to people. Uh, and then Got you it. throw activators into the mix and then everyone kind of gets lost. But yeah, so, so again, I'll just uh, briefly iterate. So there's a, kind of the expression of these proteins. And when these proteins are expressed, they go and they look and bind to this location on the genome um, where uh, their, their, their protein will bind to that uh, DNA sequence. That DNA sequence is right next to the location where this RNA polymerase will bind. And so because this, so this RNA polymerase will try to come in and it literally is like the, the repressor is standing there blocking it from almost like walking into a door or phys it is physically stopping it from getting to that location that the RNA polymerase also wants to bind at. So if this RNA polymerase cannot bind, then there is no expression of whatever downstream gene. In this case, we have our green fluorescent protein. So again, this, this inducer, where this inducer comes in, is it, it, it can be, there's a whole litany of potential things that can be, be seen as inducers. Um, but in this case, we're gonna just talk about these generic kind of inducer that'll go ahead and bind on a separate location on the repressor protein. And that will just kind of induce a switch. Like it'll, it'll physically change its form such that it can't bind to that location on the DNA in that promoter um, where, it, where, it's, uh, where it's inhibiting the RNA polymerase. So with that repressor not repressing any longer, the RNA polymerase can go ahead and bind and transcribe and, and then eventually tra translation occurs uh, and proteins happen. So yeah. yeah, it really is, um, you have to kind of parse it out in your brain. I love writing things out. I don't know where I'd be without a pen and a, like paper every day, but it is kind of that, that, uh, that inhibition of the inhibition is therefore activation. Correct. So it, it's easy, it's and not easy for anyone. So it's a difficult concept to like kind of wrap your brain around. Um, but I try to make it as easy as possible to follow. And again, like I do these same exact explanations for all the synthetic organic chemists in my lab. They don't get the biology either. They're probably just as attuned to it as any, um, any person off the street. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to kind of get in the weeds and, and describe these kind of complex molecular signaling um, uh, gene repression activation of these yeah. bacteria. And here in this case, you are see, using this green fluorescent protein as a tool to tell you when things are on, when things are off, when the gene is turned on, when the gene is turned off. And really when the gene is turned on is when that repressor is no longer blocking the RNA polymerase and the green fluorescent protein can be expressed and you have uh, fluorescence of, of that signal, right? Exactly. So it's so neat how we've taken this naturally occurring gene that we call green fluorescent protein from a jellyfish, yep. and now we're using as a tool to understand biology, to understand gene expression, and to understand and discover new potential drugs, which is what exactly you're doing. So it's mm -hmm. so neat that you're using 
genetic engineering, mm -hmm. you're using all of these concepts of small molecule binding and the structure now changing so it no longer can bind to the DNA. There's so many aspects mm -hmm. of, of your work that is so neat. Um, and then the other one was your reverse transcriptase PCR mm -hmm. or polymerase chain reaction. reaction. I'm sure most people on watching this video will have heard of PCR yeah. or even RT-PCR because of the pandemic and because of the SARS coronavirus uh, being an RNA virus that you first have to convert to DNA and then amplify it to make to see if you have it or not as a diagnostic. And here, you're using something similar to amplify your target uh, DNA or RNA that is a is a measurement of expression mm -hmm. of that particular gene, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It really is. Um, you know, PCR, regular PCR, um, like qPCR, RT PCRs, all of these ways that we have visualized. We we've, we've done the basic research to understand in nature how these things function. And then we've researched and analyzed these so well that we can then take them out of the system. We can produce them, we can modify them, we can use them um, in, in, in molecular genetics and molecular biology to then, again, as you're saying, assay or observe other uh, life phenomena is absolutely the reason why I love science. I think that everything that the next kind of like 50 and 100 years of, um, of this research, the, the progression of this research, we're gonna see some absolutely monumental um, uh, things produced uh, yeah. just because of the, the, the intelligence and the creativity and the application, creative application of things that are out there in nature in ways that are useful for us human beings that, that help us heal people, help us study people, help us, heal or study you know the world in general i absolutely um love engaging in science and scientific thought in this kind of synthetic biology area awesome awesome uh, mr rackless or mrs benson do you have any questions uh, of, of lauren or any of the students online uh any questions to ask um actually lauren uh, we had a question hang on one second I just wanted to thank you for all the information and for sharing your experiences. I think we have a question about your research. Uh, just one second. I don't want to just get the student here. Thank you. Uh, so how did you actually stumble across the uh, stymphomats? So I'm probably horribly misspelling or mispronouncing that word. The. Can you repeat it again? The. Uh, sorry. What's, what, what's the, uh, what? the bacteria? Yes. Oh, the, the oh. streptomyces? Yes. That's yeah. So streptomyces are really fun. Um, if you, they're just absolute super producers of natural products. Um, so we know that like the OG natural product is penicillin um, from Penicillium ropaforii. Um, however, after uh, years and years of studying natural products and kind of isolating these soil organisms. Um, again and again and again, we've discovered that uh, these streptomyces are actually the, the, the main producers of these natural products. Um, so the average streptomyces genome will have like 20 to 40 um, gene clusters that will produce or are predicted to produce natural products. Um, there, I would encourage you to just Google it. There's a wealth of information about streptomyces out there. Um, they, there's a lot of interest in kind of like exactly what I'm doing, trying to hack their genome to turn on these cryptic or unexpressed natural products. Um, for a long time, there was kind of the, the, the dark ages of antibiotic or natural product discovery um, in like the 80s to modern day, where people thought they had already isolated everything they could from, from streptomyces. Um, they would just take soil samples, place them at the lab, and they just kept getting the same compounds over and over again. But um, 
what we've done is actually now that we can sequence large sets of uh, genomes, large sets of DNA, we've actually noticed there are patterns in these sequences that we have based on functional analysis of the genes, we understand those to be natural product synthesizing genes. Again, we just don't know, we don't see them show up when they're when we isolate them. So there's kind of this reemergence and this refocus on streptomyces in particular because they have so many predicted natural products um, lurking within their genome. There's a refocus on trying to, again, hack the system and, and turn these guys on. But it really is just because they are just have a monstrous amount of natural products uh, in their um, in their genomes. That's awesome. And, you know, something else that you touched on that is so revealing um, is the soil wars that are happening constantly. Yeah. And it's this battle between bacterial populations that are fighting each other, but mm -hmm. that some are working with each other mutualistically yeah. and against each other. And all of these natural products that are being produced to fight this war and, you know, get, get going. I, I once I once heard a crazy statistic that a clump of one centimeter of soil has thousands and thousands of different bacterial species. Yeah, and, oh, yeah that's true. Yeah. You tell us so. Tell us a little bit about this. Yeah. I mean, it must be it must be really complex analysis. That yeah, kind of work. and it is. There is so much um, to even talk about. You know, of course, when we're doing research, we need funding, right, to pay the bills and to eat. Um, so there's a lot of um, government and non-governmental uh, agencies that are really focused in this idea of studying the soil. Um, so there's multiple million dollars worth of grants out there. Um, that are going to researchers just studying the super complex web of information, right? Because the soil is everything. It's everything we eat and it is, you know, involved in all the biogeochemical cycles. So the way that energy and carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus, all the ways that things are processed on the earth, like it has a huge impact on the soil and the soil vice versa. Um, the cool things that my PI told me when I was first interviewing her that if you hold just like a clump of soil in your hand, half of that weight that you feel is actually the mass of microbes. Half of it. Yeah, wild. Um, the other thing is that if you've ever walked outside after it's rained and you smell that amazing just after rain smell, that's actually, I think it's geosimmon, which is produced by streptomyces. So they, it's a volatile compound that they, I think it's a signaling compound, um, but it, it's aerosolized uh, when the water droplets hit it and it creates that beautiful fresh smell that we all love. Um, so there's just, the soil is absolutely bonkers. You like, I feel disrespectful when I step on it sometimes just knowing what crazy stuff is going on down there. Um, but it's, it's totally fascinating. Um, people talk about like space is the final frontier, but I'd say soil is the first frontier and we haven't figured that one out yet. Um, but no, not not to insult the aerospace engineers out there. No doubt, no doubt. And uh, I, you know, we have some some of the greatest soil biologists, even at Purdue, Cindy Nakatsu. If you haven't worked with her, she's absolutely incredible and oh yeah, uh, wonderful out. bioinformatician and uh, that studies populations of of soil microbes and so on. And this work, I mean. If you think about it, knowing about bacterial populations can also lead into this world of microbiomes and how yeah. the, the concept that we in our guts, we have more bacteria than uh, human cells on our body uh, count by count. And that we this microbiome allows us to be healthy because they help us digest, they help us keep up an immune system that, that we have, they help us combat diseases. And so, you know, it, it's very interesting this work of how we are harnessing 
the work that bacteria are doing, both as you've done for molecular biology, molecular genetic applications, engineering, taking the best tools, the GFP, taking the genes, taking the PCR, all of this, and, and using his tools to harness the, the uh, information and the molecules that these bacteria are making as tools again and mm -hmm. wonderful work wonderful yeah. I, any other questions um from the crowd and if not i really want to thank you lauren this has uh, has been really a uh, very very great talk and and uh you know you touched on so many gems here that mm -hmm. i think are, are worth uh taking notice and maybe even watching this video again i'll remind the viewers that we are posting these videos on our youtube channel and uh please follow us uh to to get on that channel lauren one last question mm -hmm. what does the future look like for you what's the next steps what are the next five years and let's say after you graduate after you get your phd what do you yeah so i'm still i'm still a little tbd uh i think there's a lot of cool stuff that's happening in like um molecular genetics or synthetic biology startups so a lot of like taking the research that individuals like i am doing and and moving it into the the commercial space or or those those better applications for like human health there's also a lot of phenomenal research that's being done at um uh, national labs here in the u.s um, and I'm very interested, I'm crossing my fingers that we get a, a collaboration with the Joint Genomic Institute that we applied for, um, and they'll help us do um, this, the, the repressor inducer studies that I was talking about. So I'm really kind of leaning toward government work, um, but I'm also, I, I got to keep my eyes open because it's like every day there's some uh, new inspiring tool out there. Um, that I'm just, I'm, I'm really excited to see what these next handful of years are, are going to do for the field. Great. Well, I wish you all the best, best wishes and uh, much, much success in all your work and all your research uh, and your future endeavors with, with your PhD and your career. I thank you again for taking part of the Purdue Lecture Hall series. And I, I wanna thank everybody that joined us today too. And I uh, hope you can join us again next week, I believe is our next speaker. Um, let me see if I can pull up my calendar here and I can tell you exactly. Uh, we have, no, actually next week, we do have a speaker, I believe, but I'm not really sure is, if she's ready or not. Robin, do you know? No, um, our next speaker is going to be uh, April 14th, and that's Caroline Pleski. Pleski? Oh, yeah, Caroline Plesha. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, so join us again on April 14th for Caroline Plesha and Lauren Wilbanks. Thank you so much again, and it's been a pleasure uh, talking to you today. Yeah, Best thanks wishes. so much for this opportunity. Oops, sorry. Thank you no so worries. much. Thanks. Thank you. And have a good rest.